Miss Olha Bliablonska. Miss Olha is a candidate of philological science and a professor at the Department of Ukrainian Literature at Volin National University, named after Lesa Ukrainka. Her scientific interests include Ukrainian classic literature, such as the history of Shevchenko, of Shevchenko studies, and her today's topic is a canon of national literature, Ukrainian versions. Please, Miss Olga. Hello, dear colleagues, dear community. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude for being able to join this program, which is an amazing platform for scientific communication and support and great support for educators in Ukraine. So if you don't mind, I would like to learn to show me my screen. Miss Svetlana, could you see it well? Yes, we see it. Thank you. So the category of national literature is one of the most fundamental in understanding the literature process. Back in the early 2000s, Lukash Skupeiko noted that the creation of history of literature that would be at the same time a history of literature and a history of literature and the history of national literature reminds an urgent need for theoretical and literal knowledge, especially its in its development in the post-colonial space. In contemporary liter literature studies, various approaches to reading the history of Ukrainian literature have been tested, such as concept conceptualization of Ukrainian literature as an integral part of European civilization uh, based on Oksana Pahlovska's study, as a universal synthetic picture that would testify to the completeness of the literature process and national critical reception based on Vitaly Dunchuk's ideas, a model of psychohistory of literature based on Nila Zborovska as a geocultural project according to Yaroslav Polishuk in the light of the dominant national existential methods, and this is the vision of Petro Ivanishin and a number of other researchers. Uh, Grigory Hrabovich, based on post-structuralism, considers inappropriate to create a history of literature with its desire for comprehensiveness and authority. My co-publisher not in the paradox of the post-structuralist informed attitude to history, on one hand, and the imperative is to deny final assessments, knowledge and judgments. And on the other hand, the genre of history itself requires division according to the key was of attention, not with the was of attention, which means that canonization cannot be avoided. In the constant of the problem of literature, canon and myth, uh, Tatiana Hundurova examines such aspects as a folk canon, postmodern canonists, the modernist canon, feminist decanonization, Harold Bloom's affirmative canon, and post-colonial canon, canon. The researcher developed the thought of the contemporary British literature, literary critic and philosopher Terry Eagleton. The so-called literary canon, as noted by Terry Eagleton, or the great tradition of national literature, a canon that must be recognized as a structure model modeled by certain people for certain reason and at certain time. The constructing each of such narratives, such as Literary canons, a great tradition, the national literature is a condition of any historiography. Marco Publishing notes that there are several that there are several approaches. In traditional literature, history as a unit of study has almost always meant the history of national literatures, the subject to which have been people, texts. Uh, are considered as belonging to national communities and often, but not always, united by common language. Among the alternatives is a desire to show the history of literature as taking place above nation, while not rejecting the idea of national communities. 
and calling for other communities and entities to be seen alongside them. Accordingly, the question arises, what kind of model of nation we do have in, dine, we do have in mind? An ethnocultural one, according to which the nation consists of an ethnic and cultural majority and other ethnocultural communities recognized as minorities, or perhaps a civic one, where the nation is a priori recognized as ethnoculturally multi-component. According to Grigory Savakon, national identification will become a likely and expected methodology for the new history of Ukrainian literature. Under the sign of national identity, Tamara Shumilo studied the literature and literature critical process of the late 19th and early 20th century, while Larissa, Larissa Moros examined the national universal and spiritual in the concept of the true unity of the literature. Mikola Bonder emphasized that of all the centuries of national spiritual life, the 19th century was crucial for the formation of Ukrainian spirituality and Ukrainian artistic thinking. Researchers Mikola Bonder also actualized the opinion of mid-20th century literary terrorists Rene Velek and Austin Warren that the history of national literature is a broad problem that is related to questions about the national spirit and character, which are indirectly related to art. Thus, the idea of possibility of different of different models of national literature is gradually being formed, as well as the idea that the history of Ukrainian literature is fundamentally anti-colonial. The post-colonialist reading of Ukrainian literature and culture in general is presented in the following studies, well-known studies, by Miroslav Shkandri in the Embrace of Empire Russian Ukrainian Literature of the Modern Age, Ava Thompson, Troubadours of Empire Russian Literature and Colonialism, Tamara Hundorova, Transit culture symptoms of postcolonial trauma. Olena Yurchuk in the Shadow of Empire, Ukrainian literature in the light of postcolonial theory. Postcolonialism generations culture ed by Tamara Gundorova and Agnieszka Matusiak, and etc. The desire to prove the self-sufficiency of the original component of national literature can be seen as a variant of its history. This tendency was evidenced by Stefania Andrusiv monograph Nodus national, of national identity, national identity Nodus, the lived text of 1930 century. Uh, the Hutsul text is well represented in the studies of Irene Mikitin, Tetyana Bykova, Mykola Vasilchuk, Miroslav Layuk, Alexandra Sali, and others. The publication of the history of literature, Kiev Lviv 2010, which was inspired by Yurko Prohashko's conceptualization of the concept of Halicin literature, demonstrates the feasibility of multiple readings of the literature process. Increase in the number of research texts with regional specifics will be a process of realizing the diversity of national culture, provided that such texts are brought under common denominator, that is, that they are all differently similar, all Ukrainian. It's appropriate to recall Ivan Lysiak Rudnitsky's conclusions that the parallelism of historical processes in the history of 19th century Ukraine, both including Nadnipryanchina and Halichina, are from the internal unity of the nationality. The discourse of national identity is one of the defining ones for Ukrainian post-colonial literature studies, through the prism of which the history of national literature is created. It includes the studies by Olga Gnatyuk, 2005, Miroslava Ivanishin, 2015. And so through the prism of, of these studies, the history of national literature is created, among other things. Volodymyr Moronets, in his preface to the collective monograph literature and ideology, Kiev 2017 sounded the alarm 
the concept of non-ideology is now a deadly weapon of the enemies against the national state worldview in all its expressions. Modernity proves the relevance of the anti-colonial and anti-imperial dimension of Ukrainian literature. The anti-colonial trend of the new Ukrainian literature initiated by initiated by the idea of state building and national revival in the Van Kotlerevsky NA determined in various general forms, images, and textual components. I propose to turn to a new social phenomenon of the time, the imagine of Russian or the Moscow as a representative of the Russian Empire as the evidence of its military policy. Since Moscow's all the Russians in Ukraine were represented mainly by the army, wrote, li wrote literary critic and journalist Igor Mikhailin, this word also acquired the second meaning, soldier, warrior. In Shevchenko, the word Moscow is presented in all its meaning. He was well aware of the internal situation in Ukraine and universal problems that were the result of the colonialist policy of the Tsarist regime in Ukraine. In Ukraine, public opinion of the late 18th and early 19th centuries saw the image of the Cossack as a knight who devoted his life to serving Ukraine. However, the destruction of the Zaporizhian siege continued the chain of imperial subjugation of Ukraine. In 1783, the Cossack service and Cossack regiments were abolished. They were replaced by Carbine regiments, just as Sloboda regiments have been replaced by Hussars, Mikhailo Grushevsky wrote. Since 1797, the Ukrainians have been serving a completely hostile system, the army of Imperial Russia. The term of military service was 25 years, which was considered equal to a death sentence, as Orest of Telny wrote. In, in 1834, it was 20 years, and later 15, 20, and eventually 10. Since 1874, when universal military service was introduced, the service lasted 10 years. So in such future was often planned for an orphan, a bastard, or a widow son. We remember in the classic text Marusia by Grigory Kvitkasnovyanka, the reason why Naomi refused to give his only daughter in marriage to the orphan Vasil was, the, was exactly the military service. Той горбатий, той багатий, тих чотири в хаті. Усі не влад, усі назад, в усіх доля мати. А у вдови один син, та й той якраз під аршин. Так, Тарас Шевченко. This is how Тарас Шевченко recreates the circumstances of the uh, rights of a widow's only son. So this was the citation from the poem Yowl, which dates back to 1844. A society of slaves uh, cannot make a fair choice. In the comedy Dream, which was also written in 1844, uh, in the first Dream, Sin Tarashevchenko portrayed Ukrainians as an eloquent manifestation of a socially and morally deformed nation. And one of the evidences of deprivation of rights is that the widow's only son was sent to the army. In the pursuit of social harmony and truth, Taras Shevchenko models the circumstances in which a monk reads the holy scriptures, instructs people so that brother does not kill brother and does not steal, and the widowed man is not given to the army. So this is a citation from the uh, poem, Oh, I will sharpen my comrade. Uh, at the beginning and in the last year of his army service, Taras Shevchenko wrote two versions of the poem Maskaleva Krenitsa. Both of them uh, in 1847 and 1857, uh, the community gave away a widow's son to the army. In the later version, the author commented, what truth people have, my son? I think it is still the same in our Ukraine. 
and there will be no other under slavery. Thus, the slave morality of the serf cannot make a fair choice. The orphan will face the same choice as fate foresees eternal suffering for them. Taras Shevchenko, with his bitter irony, predicts the future of a sad child. He will not know where to go in this wide free world, and he will go to work for others, and one day, so that he does not cry, does not grieve, so that he can find a place to stay, he will be given to the army. This is poem and Golden and Dear, 1848. <clears throat> And even in one of his last works, we came together, got married, united in 1860, which is an example of intimate lyrics with an active involvement of philosophical principles. The concept of Moscovia and the Moscow as a great destructive force in Ukrainian society appear among the social factors. The Moscow stole the girls and the boys were taken to the army. The problem of recruitment reaches a significant dramatic tension in the poetic message to Gogol, which dates back to 1844. A father will not slaughter his son for honor, glory, brotherhood, for the freedom of the country. This would be, see, a widow's contribution to the throne fathered, but a dumb man's payment. A Ukrainian son will die not for national ideas, but for someone else's homeland. In various folklore genres, the figure of a Moscow soldier as a representative of Moscow incorporated the national features of a Russian man. Matvi Nomis's publication, Ukrainian Proverb Sayings, first published in 1864, we can find a lot of such proverbs and sayings. For example, cut a hole in the wall and run away from a Moscow. Renounce the devil, but pray away the Moscow. Do not fight with a soldier, not your brother. Moscow's ears are like shaking and everything is a devil's show. Moscow consulted with the devil and they were useful for bad things. A Moscow is like a crow, but more cunning than the devil. The ethnographic Georgi Bulashev recorded an apocritical legend about the earnings of the Lord, the holy apostle Peter, and a soldier, where the latter is punished for deception and greed. It is said that for money, a soldier cheats and he even has to confess to a, previ uh, to a previous offense. Uh, the researcher also uh, gives the legend that the Moscals in a tavern brutally drove the Lord and the Apostle Peter from a one place near the stove, uh, got punished them for this and every time the Moscows have to go uh, on uh, to war it will be wet cold frosty and blizzardy for them ukrainians perceive the Moscows as an exponent of a foreign imperial ideology the fate of shevchenko's katerina from the poem with the same name is evidence of demoralize, demoralizing influence of the soldier on the ukrainian village uh, Leonid Bilecki says that the poet presents two opposing national and ethical worldviews, which in their mutual relations lead to a conflict and disaster. And this letter, the weaker always dies, although at the heart of his spiritual attributes, he reveals a deeper nature, which is more solid and consistent. In this poem, the poet for the first time outlines two national and moral and social types that are mutually exclusive. The problem of demoralizing influence of the Russian army on the patriarchal foundations of the Ukrainian village is echoed in many other pieces of literature. A typical example is the story of Oksana from the novel of the same name written by Grigory Kvitkas-Novyanenko. 
insolence and arrogance as components of the ethnomental model of the Moscow are well captured in the drama of the first half of the 19th century. In Ivan Kotlerevsky's play Moscow Magician, Mikhailo expresses the popular point of view in a dispute with a soldier. Get along with the Moscow, but keep a stone under your belt. Tatiana, as the mistress of the house, tries to stop these contradictions, demonstrating a loyal visual of Ukrainians in the context of the Russian Empire. Now, whether a Moscow or our person, it's all the same. We are all children of the same father, the white czar. The only difference is that some are very loud and others are humble. The plot of Vasil Gogol's play, The Simple Man or the Cunning of a Woman Outwitted by a Soldier, which was created in 1920s, is similar, but the final scene of the argument between the soldier and the man who unexpe unexpectedly returned is not included. The image of a cunning, experienced soldier, a Ukrainian by birth, is of a slightly different type. For a long period of time, as Miroslav Skandri notes, he was an honorable partner in the construction of the empire, that is, a Maloros. After his military service, service, he had to play to prove that he was not a stranger, but one of the Ukrainians. The imperial system made them people without a homeland. It is no coincidence that Hikori Kvitkosnovyanenko demonstrates in his dramatic works that such characters renew their lost family ties. <clears throat> For example, the retired soldier Osip Skorik, the uncle of the serf Alexei, and the Lancer Simasvot in Nast is Nastya's brother. Therefore, their magical actions are aimed at helping their relatives, while at the same time, they try to achieve a happy resolution of the conflict, as the author thinks. The ideology about, the ideology about Shelmenka by Grigory Kvitka-Snavyaninka deserves special attention. In the play Shelmenka, which was written in 1829, the author shows the roots of the Moscow social type. Thus, the Volost Clark Shelmenko is punished with military service for trying to get the son of a wealthy, <clears throat> of a wealthy widow, Stepanida, to join the army. The hero's surname, as we can see, was created according to the class principle from the old German Shelma, which means a cunning and clever person in his actions. The marriage of the lovers, the poor captain Skortsov and the daughter of Spak Prisenko was not only due to the action of the cunning Shelmenko, whose image is modeled after the servant of two gentlemen, Carlo Goldoni, but also to the Spak family legend, continued by the day labor, which features two brothers, one of whom lives in, in the Russian territory. In this way, the author demonstrates the way in which Ukrainian turns into a Malros as part of the Russian Empire. The Spak who sunk under the windows in the Hetman's dungeon had two sons. One Spak led the line of Spak just like you, and the other Spak became Moscow and was called Kvartsov in Moscow's name. It's all the same as the Spak or Skvarets. So, in, so on Moscow's side, uh, Spak closes his national identity in his now Shkvorets, Skvortsov. In Hrihori, Kvitkaus Novyanenskos short story, The Soldier's Portrait, the idea of which is to expose the incompetence of Russian critics' judgments of Ukrainian literature, both the real Moscow and his double in the portrait are intended to emphasize the privileged position of the conqueror, the invader, whose side always has the upper hand. The fate of Shevchenko's Katerina will be inherited to some extent by the heroine of the first edition of the poem Moscow's Well, 
uh, written in 1847, after the fire, Ketra with most, co with most cause wandered off somewhere. Certain analogies can be traced in the image of Oksanochka from the poem We Grew Up Together, once in, written in 1849, who went on a trip, followed the Moscow's and disappeared. Returned, however, a year, but what of it? She came back with a bastard, sheared. By the way, for a long period of time, literature critics believed that Oksana Kovalenko was a prototype of the fate of Oksana's character in the autobiographical lyric, We Grew Up Together. However, the metric books and confessional paintings of St. Kirill, Kirill's Church show otherwise. She made a serve from a village of Pedenivka and Kasuroka. And in 1843, when Taras Shevchenko visited Kirillivka, she had two daughters. The lyrical heroine of the poem, he did not return from a campaign, did not become a Moscow. The Ukrainian environment is ambiguous about Maria, ironizing her dreams of becoming a hussar. Tetarivna and Marivna proud of people and a Moscow scoundrel, greeted with a low bow. And now she is waiting for him with a bastard. The lyrical plot of the poem Titarina Numerivna, written in 1860. The female character chose her own fate to be not a Ukrainian but Moscow disgrace in her honorable family. The fate of such Moscow is the center of poetic reflections of Taras Shevchenko samples of woman poetry. He fell in love with me. She grows old alone in someone else's house. The story hired girls presents the image of an old Moscow who female Moscow who lives out her life alone in a cold and hunger. The image of Moscow and Shevchenko's vision will become particularly dramatic as the poet himself will experience soldier's destiny. In the cycle in the case in the prison of Rotten 1847, created during the investigation of the Kirill and Mephodius Brotherhood, Taras Shevchenko intuitively felt his future. According to Viktor Petrov in the poem of Rill in the Morning Records, the poet transposes himself in the image of Moscow and Crutches, who later turns to the village. The poem No Sleep But the Night is Like the Sea contains expressive contracts between two models of the behavior and impotent and immoral Moscow sentry and the ethical suffering Ukrainian who does not complain about the trials of fate but professes forgiveness. I found myself in the Orksk fortress in a gray soldier's overcoat. And now I'm exactly like the Moscow that Kuzma Trofimovich painted to the gentleman who was very fond of the gardens. Taras Shevchenko ironically identifies himself as a soldier in a letter to Andriy Lizohuk dated October 22, 1847, recalling the character in Grigory Kivitkas Novyanko's story, Soldier's Portrait. Taras Shevchenko does not want to identify himself with Moscow, nor wants his friend to perceive him as Moscow. Thus, in a letter from Novopetrivsky fortification to Josef Borodensky, dated November 3rd, 1854, he shows, I was afraid to paint myself as a Moscow, lest you should be frightened when you look at my face in a Moscow overcoat, or God forbid, in a uniform. Also, Trashevchenko first self-portrait was made in exile between 23rd June and 11 December 11, 1847 in Orcs Fortress. He is a portrait in a soldier's uniform and a brimless cap, and it almost documentary portrait of Mikola, of Mikolai's soldier, Nikolai's soldiers. As already mentioned at the beginning and in the late year of his exile, Rashevchenko wrote two versions of the poem Moscow's Well. As a rule, change in the logical emphasis of the text go in the direction from Maxim's the foolish to Maxim's the saint, from Maxim's Christian humility to the motives of the bar, barnacle's repentance, as Leonid Plushin in the 1847, Maxim joined the army voluntary instead of a widow's son. The text of 1857 states that after the fire, Maxim will go to work for another man, and at the same time provides information about recruiting for pickers. 
Pekinus were military settlements of Cossacks and peasants in southern Ukraine, created by the Russian authorities in 1764, at the time of the abolition of Hetmanate. The next section already states that Ochakia was taken by Moscow and was there and, and it was there when Maxim was crippled. In both version of the text, Maxim returns to his native village as a crippled, as a literate cripple. In both editions, Taras Shevchenko ironically wrote about Maxim's continued to wear great braids with curls and sprinkle floor on them. In the 1856 work, he, like a general, will clean up on Sunday and will go to the Temple of God. I will stand on the wing and sing and for the thing given and take, and even be the apostle among the church. Sometimes the righteous man will speak Russian language. As we can see, military service in the Russian army shape other models of behavior that were uncharacteristic of the Ukrainians' previous life. This is under the guise of noble, respectable, competent Christian. There is a completely different essence, and its goal is to destroy Ukrainian society from within. The metaphorical image of a devil dug by Maxim for everyone is a way of spreading the idea of imperial subjugation. Here, to some extent, one can trace a connection with the text of the three years period, the mystery is a great seller. In the story of the first soul, it's about poisoned water that destroyed the entire family, nation. Shevchenko considers not the internal rural ethos and structuredness to be the wellspring of collective and personal vices, but external political violence, the reign of Catherine II, when the statehood was finally destroyed and aligned social orders and aligned philosophy of salt was introduced in Ukraine, as Yaroslav Rozumny emphasizes. The researcher stresses that under the external is the reality of the poem lies its ironic subtext and the main concept of the Moscow's well is to ridicule Maxim holiness and Barnak's repentance and to awaken an active protest against the Moscow's well and those who still take water from it. He the Yaroslav Rozumny sees the characters of Moscow, Krenitsa, the Moscow Moxim, the Brent Barnack, the self made and Fraktan Patanin Katarina, her mother and the widowed mother are antipodes of the Cossacks. So here's a quote The parodic varieties of a crippled people and collective allegory of Slavophile ideal of the citizen. They are anti heroes, actors in a tragic comic in this to mystery, or setter of the absurd, in which everything has the opposite meaning. The mannequins or allegories of mercenarism, orphanhood, localism, and pickering in Franco Russian wigs, medals, and crosses of merit. The army as a representative of the imperial, imperial ideology is clearly described by Taras Shevchenko in his novel The Twins. In a female excursion, the author showed that the founder of the family, Posokira, served in the military under Russian Emperor Peter III and was promoted to the rank of nobility. However, the moderalizing influence of Moscow will be most evident in the time of Sukira's younger son, Zosim. Rashevchenko presents the appearance of the twins in the novel as a variant of the plots of Katerina and Hyreling. On Monday, the regiment left Paryaslav and the young woman gave birth to twins and dropped off them off to wealthy farmers. Consider the image of Zosim Sukir as the son of the dragon, Magdalena Laszlo Kusuk emphasizes how he morally decayed in the pleasures of life in the army. The surgeon notes that Taras Shevchenko does not take into account heredity because uh, by Savati and the Black Zosim are sons of the same father and brought up in the same environment in the childhood in the ideal family of Nikiforov and Praskovia Sukira. 
While we agree with the observation about Shevchenko's white black opposition, uh, we would also point out that in the twin myth, which is typical of dualistic mythologies, one of the brothers is associated with everything good or useful, and, and the other with everything bad. Those Sims letters signed with the distorted name, surname Sukirin testifies to the loss of national identity caused by Mos Kirin, the Kirin is a bad sign, Nikifer Fedorovich said quietly. The sign would become more and more pronounced in Zosim's moral decline. Drunkness, debts, begging money from his parents, and the use of girl. Shevchenko largely explains Zosim's moral decline by the fact that he had received military education was part of the society of military noble youth. Pavlo Zaitsev wrote, the researcher emphasized that the image of Zosim Sukhir is connected with the realities that surround the Shevchenko in exile. The Russian barracks and moral roads that flourished and it destroyed more than one living soul. This is evidence, for example, by Taras Shevchenko's letters to Vasil Zhukovsky, written between January 1st and 10th. 1850 and to Semen Hulak dated June 30th, 1856. The doctor Savati Sakia met his brother on the distant Orks fortress not as an officer but as a soldier, has already lost conscious of his complete decline. Zosim is called the unhappy, unhappy, an autorial reminiscence of the story unhappy written in the same 1855. In, in Savati's reflections on the death of everything human, human in his brother's life and beliefs, a rhetorical question is raised about the causes of his decline. Dr. Sokera is the protagonist of the four count financer. Taras Shevchenko proves that the roots of its corrosion lie in the rotten essence of the Russian Empire. In an empire, there is always a concept of center and margin. St. Petersburg, as the political center of Russia, is presented only in a negative way. This is where the moral decline of the soldier Zosim takes place. Sokira is assimilated, becoming Sokirin. Let's recall Sochenko's uh, image of Kirpa uh, Gnuchko Shirenko in his address, Gentleman Subscripts, in the poem The Haidamaks. The outskirts of the empire fulfill a punitive function in the fate of Officer Zosim. The military fortifications created here are a bastion of the empire. And the Russian church that consecrates the site for the fort is just as strong. The soldiers serving in the rhyme of fortification resemble prisoners. Savati's reflections capture the dominant feature of the fortress as a closed space. As I was driving closer to the fortress, I wondered, a strange thought, if they sing songs in this fortress. And I was ready to bet that they don't. In such a setting, only dead silence is possible, interrupted by heavy sighs, not sonorous songs. It is appropriate to read Sodom and Hamora in Savari's dream as an allegory of the Russian Empire and the holy tree of the Kyrgyz, which was lonely green in the desert, as the faith and hope of the colonized land for revival. Here we can see an outer allusion to the poem God had an ex be behind the door. The story of the Sakir family is a symbolic expression of the fate of Ukraine, in particular its ancient educational traditions, the imperial corrosion, and the desire to preserve national identity. And the text shows that the empire did not turn Ukraine into Malorussia. The allegory made it possible to highlight current issues. Mykola Kostomarov and Taras Shevchenko, as prominent representatives of both the literary process and social aspirations, turn to this method to show the essence of the Russian Empire, appealing in particular to the ancient era. The, 
Krimusius Kordus by Mykola Kastamarov is a dramatic work of allegoric nature in which the author, as a writer and historian, tries to convey the truth about the modern era of Mykola I. Despite its distinct autobiographical nature, the text was written under the influence of interrogations in the case of Cyril and Methodius Brotherhood. It is no co coincidence that the main character of the drama is a historian and dedication to the bride Anna Kahelska. The idea of the work is directed in a social political direction, as evidenced by the division into three acts with eloquent titles Informers, Tyrant, and Historian. The first and second acts show the moral decline of public morality and the emperor, while the third act demonstrates the moral superiority of the historian. Mikhail Saltykov Shidrin, in a review published in the journal Savremenik, noted only the historical basis of the work. It is simply a dramatized historical study of the reign of the Roman Emperor Tiberius, who brought tyranny to such a degree of sophistication and suspicion that he considered even a reminder of old Rome a personal insult that could lead to unfavorable comparisons. Uh, the same idea was expressed by Nikolai Leskov, a Russian writer and literary critic of the second half of the 19th century. He pointed to systematic corruption of morals due to the loss of civic virtues by society, a system of espionage and venality that reduced the citizens of free Rome to the level of Caesar's butlers. As a historian, Cremusius Cordus perceives the world not only within the boundaries of his era, so he has more opportunities to objectively comprehend the present. He assumes that a society built on slander has no future, because Romans will become each other's executioners by making denunciations. In such a society, there is total disenfranchisement. It is painful for a historian to see the decline of his people, so he thinks of leaving his native country, so not to hear his native language in the mouth of thieves and traitors. Crimusius Cordus Annals praised past freedom, which poses a danger to the dictatorial rule of Emperor Tiberius. In Act Two, Mykola Kastamaro reveals the arrogance of the tyrant and his entourage. It turns out that Emperor Tiberius, having no pleasure from Bacchus and Venus, is looking for another pleasure. Therefore, he is pleased not only to destroy his opponents, but to increase their suffering. Tiberius's disturbed psyche likes to resist the authorities. It is a kind of game for him. The emperor amuses himself with people's fates, simulates situations of social tension or conditional democratic freedoms. He believes that the law is for weak creatures and for Caesar, there is no law but his own will. And what about informers? They all deserve their law. Or Rome, Rome. Or nation, greedy for slavery, gambling for money, lusting after women. You bring this scourge upon yourself. I beat you and assure you that I love you. I harness you and assure you that I am the keeper of your peace. Poor, poor Romans, comfort Tiberius who despises you. The last scene of Act Two is Tiberius's reflections on the role of the historian in society, on what he should be like from the perspective of the emperor. The historian is an important person in the state. A historian is an interpreter of the fate of the people, an explanator of the past, and therefore a prophesy of the future. We respect historians like Cremesius Cordus, but we don't need them. We need historians who would praise what we like, and blame what we don't. Historians who would turn events inside out for a handful of coins, for a gentle glance from a strong man, even dishonorably invent the unprecedented things. Act three shows what kind of historian Cremesius Cordus was. 
In building the image of this character, Nikolai Kostomarov is largely a supporter of Frederick Schlegel's idea that the historian is a prophet turned backwards. In his speech at the trial, Cremesius Cordus emphasized the idea of an objective assessment of history. However, the state machine will draw its own conclusion. It is noteworthy that it will be voiced by one of the senators, legislators. I propose to establish forever a law by which every writer, historian, poet, philosopher, orator, for the slightest praise of what is not in accord with the present order, for the slightest dislike of what is part of the rules of the present government, and for any expression that of that before being considered by the Senate would be recognized by the will of Caesar as denouncing criminal intentions, would be subject to trial by force of the law on insulting the majesty. At the same time, the writings of the offender should be burned and destroyed forever. And all those who, contrary to a court sentence, dare to keep such writings in their possession should be tried by the same law. In this way, the tyrant will ensure that there are no dissenters and no manifestations of criticism. Accordingly, the final scene contains the news of the burning of the annals of the Roman Empire and the fate of the author, Cremisius Cordus, who chose death by refusing to eat. The Roman historian Cremisius Cordus is a historical figure who is credited with the annals the text of which has not been preserved. At the same time, there are obvious parallels to the personality of the author of the work. It is likely that Mykola Kostomarov was a supporter of Seneca's ideas, as the ancient Roman philosopher approved of suicide as a challenge to circumstances. We can read about that in Moral Letters to Lucilius. It is known that during the investigation over the Cyril and Mesorius Brotherhood, Mykola Kostomarov refused to eat, perhaps thinking about suicide. His alter ego, the literary hero Cremesius Cordus, would follow suit. More than a century later, 1965-1967, Vasil Stus would create the cycle Kostomarov in Saratov, referring to the life of the Cyril and Methodius scholar. And although according to Ivan Zuba, these poems relate not so much to the biography of Kostomarov as to the spiritual biography of Stuls himself. It is only a way of speaking about himself and Ukraine, about himself in Ukraine. It was the political circumstances of Imperial Russia under Nicholas I and the Soviet era that prompted the writer to do such anthologies. The allegory of Nicholas first heir is also evident in the Rashevchenko's poems and outfits. The, the, first, the first work he wrote after his exile in the story of persecution of the first Christians, the author demonstrated the persecution of dissidents, in particular the Kirill and Methodius Brotherhood members. The reception of this contemporary's prowess proves that this is in the subtext. Thus, in a well-known letter from Pantelemon Kulish to Taras Shevchenko, it is emphasized. Your no fits, brother Taras, is a good thing, but not for printing. It's not good to remind a good son of a lazy father, expecting no good from the son. He's the first man in our family now. If it weren't for him, he, he, he wouldn't even be allowed to breathe, and the freedom of the serf is his business. The people closest to him now are us, writer, not the bosses. He loves us, he has faith in us, and our faith will not disgrace him. The poem is about the successor of the throne, Alexander II, who began his reign with liberal decrees, 
such as an amnesty for political prisoners and the intelligentsia lived in expectation of new social changes. And when the poem was first published in the journal Osnova in 1862, issue four, but Amon Kulish emphasized its historical nature in his preface, not in, the, not in the universal meaning of the role of the image of the mother. It's not was is it one of the first to, that uh, one of the first to openly express an opinion about the political nature of the work was Yevhens Garsky in an article of 1868 published in the popular journal Pravda, which was published in Lviv. The critic characterized the neo fafids as political poem under historical context. Cover. Kostaras Shevchenko has other poem with a more or less hidden meaning, such as heretic Maria. But I thought that a lot of podcast about drama, the Kremutius Codus, I would like to consider this work which subtext is close in reading. I apologize for extensive quotes, but I would like to hear more of Shevchenko's words in this March the days. Thank you for your attention. And I'm ready to answer your questions. Ms. Olga, thank you so much for such an interesting, informative and very relevant research. Please, dear colleagues, click, we still have time for questions. Ms. Olga, maybe you will close your slides so we all can see you. If I manage to do it. Okay, thank you so much. So, dear colleagues, please, you're welcome. Who would like to ask a question? Okay, then maybe I will use this opportunity. Uh, well, I have several questions, but I will start with uh, with this one. It's Olga. Representing the canon of national literature, you mentioned you mentioned Galician literature, and I have a, my question is about this regional dimension in the nat national literature canon. Canon. What else regional literature models are currently presented in the national literature studies? We often hear about Galician literature and what uh, what other experience can you provide? As uh, some specific, for example, Slobozhansky, Slobozhanshina literature, because I don't track this, uh, this, uh, this trends. For example, maybe we have, uh, have separate police literature. Thank you for your question, Ms. Svetlana. If we talk about the purely literature process dimensions, the writers who present specific, who present, who present specific original regularities, if we could try to formulate this, this is one approach. If we talk at the level of history of national literature, then it's quite a different aspect. In general, the original principle was always involved, has been involved in the literature concepts. For example, even the talk about the stage of specific literature phenomenon, maybe about Kharkiv romantic, romantic school, or the Osnova era romanticism, Halysian variant to Kiev school. Of course, in the later in the later stages of literature development, we also have the similar regularities. In the modern literature process, is not an exception. For example, Kiev and Chetoma school of uh, school of prose. However, from the from the historical point of view, it's obvious that the meaning is as follows: the research that relates to regional dimension of literature process are somehow somehow guided towards the common opinion that all that all these writers represent some specific nature of the region narrow which you know, which is not always uh, manifested in the, at the level of language or dialectic languages 
or local local name geographical name or very specific regional views some kind of narrow world from 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 point of view of resident of Zakarpatia or Polisia, all of them has a common denominator all of them are different but commonly similar because they create a whole picture of the national literature and to recreate the similar processes maybe from chronological point of view they're different there are other facts because there are several factors involved but in this way or another the, the sense the meaning is all this regional literature historic historical concept are the same uh, with slightly different content okay thanks a lot miss olga Dear colleagues, any more questions? No? Okay, I will ask another question then. Okay, please, Ms. Nadia. I will, it will take just a few seconds. I would like to express my gratitude to Ms. Olga. I just realized that I have to, to sit and reread the Moscow as well, which I have read many years ago. But now when I have listened to this report, I now I realize how, should, how how much we need to what to reconsider this processes of 20th century in the view of modernity and that we have many useful information and observations uh, taken from 19th century so so i would like just to express my appreciation thanks mr dear okay my next question is about actualization of Moscow's image in the, under the modern conditions. You, you, you quoted very interesting, very interesting quotes and sayings related to Moscow. And my question is, have you had an opportunity to track the development of this Moscow image right now, after the start of war, in which memes, at which new sayings, how the language creation works at the colloquial level, at the literature level, how this is transformed, or, where, or, or if it transforms, because right now the meme creation related to this very relevant images of Moscow and the enemy and Russia as the enemy state. They're right now extremely widespread and relevant. What could you say about it, Miss Olga? Yes, thank you. At the same time, we witness the process where the culture uh, gains new ways of expressions, not just oral form but also visual perception, as you mentioned, the form of memes and modern, and to some extent in the modern world, it's, we also actualize what has been already said. Are there in other national cultures, other the parts of other national cultures adapted to our world, and it's not always well perceived, for example, as a publicist operation in the publicistic texts and the colloquial speech, as this lexem of orcs. Or maybe some other manifestations but eventually they all continue these negative connotations. The meaning of the words is the same. New images, new forms it indicate that the literature process and the cultural process is alive. It is a crazy language is alive. and the fact that some new nuances new aspects are born from the commute from the language once again prove that the cultural space and the literature is a part of the cultural space the literature and folklore so the cultural space is alive and us as a host as the creators of this culture we should 
we have an important function both in our in our age and for the future generations most of us are teachers are professors and we communicate with the younger generation which often creates these new aspects of meaning and clearly the interpretation of this image also in also includes something and includes not just a new morale new numerous legends and sayings but some general manifestations always a lot such as jokes political jokes and we once again may mention the original dimensions of these jokes Moscow always was uh, an image in these jokes in this way or another and representing the traditional unacceptance, unacceptance of, of enemy, of the one who brings, of who poses a threat and has intention to destroy your, some, your own and something very important for you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Olga. Unfortunately, our time for today is over. I think we would gladly continue this work. Thank you to all about the sponsor of our discussions. Thanks to all presenters and Ms. Olga Jablonska. Uh, for this very relevant, very informative uh, reports. And before we end our today meetings, before we enter today's event, I would just like to remind you that on Thursday, we'll start Shevchenko conference at 3 a.m. by Kiev time. The conference will last for three days, uh, for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Please register the link. You have already received it to the website. And once again, thank you. And once again, remind you that the that the sem that our seminar is postponed to Friday, March twenty second. Thank you, all dear colleagues. Have a nice day.